All right, I'm going to be continuing on in Ephesians this morning, going on to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this chapter, you might not have seen the theme running through it, but the theme that seems to be running through this chapter is Paul is teaching on sort of the implications of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the, I guess, on gender, on believers, right? So specifically, he's addressing it to the Ephesian church, which was a Gentile church at the time. But I guess that's why you see here he's talking about these two nations coming together into the true nation of God, as we see here in Ephesians chapter 2. But let's go through it together, okay? So <clears throat> in verse 1, We see here Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So I'll just touch on this word quickly. So quickened in the King James Bible means to be made alive, right? So when the Bible says Jesus shall judge the quick and the dead, he's not judging those that move fast, you know, he's judging the quick, those alive and the dead. Like when the Bible says, you know, the word of God is quick and powerful. It doesn't mean it's very you know, the, the movement of its speed, it's saying that it's alive, like the word is living, right, when it talks about... So when it says here, you hath he quickened, see, that's something that does happen, you know, in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. When he resurrected, you know, that is the power that makes us alive as well in the spirit. So I, want, I don't want to go in too depth in this sermon because I've preached whole sermons on, you know, what happens when we get saved, right? You know, we start off spiritually alive, we have body, soul, and spirit, then... You know, we get to the age of accountability, our spirit dies. That's what this is talking about. It says we're dead in trespasses and sins, right? That's spiritually dead, right? And everything we do is sin, right? Because when we're spiritually dead, the only thing the mind, the only thing the soul can follow is the flesh, right? Because the the, the spirit is spiritually dead. So this is why we're dead in trespasses and sins. This is why in Isaiah 64, 6, there's a famous passage. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So as an unbeliever, an unregenerate, unsaved unbeliever, all you do is sin. And some people have like struggled with this thought a bit because they say, well, don't even unbelievers do decent things you know, not all unbelievers are just like rapists and murderers and just these despicable people. Like sometimes they're respectable people with integrity. But how is what they're doing all unrighteousness? Well, Hebrews 11.6 kind of gives us a teaching here to explain why. It says here, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you don't believe in God, and if you don't believe in the true God, you know, how can you do anything for God? Right? So remember, what is the first and greatest commandment? The first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So how does somebody keep the first and greatest commandment when they don't even believe in God? They don't even believe on God. This is why without faith it's impossible to please Him. So the unbeliever ultimately is doing it for selfish reasons, right? For, the, for their own benefit, for, or, they're, or they're doing it for other man. For man which is not the reason why we should be doing things. We should be doing things for God. And this is why, no matter what we do as unbelievers, even the, the, the most noblest thing an unbeliever can do, if he's not doing it to God's glory, then it's still sin in God's eyes. So this is why, no matter what an unbelievers do, they're dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this doesn't mean... what when See, and, and I, I touched on this in Ephesians 1, where you know a lot of these passages in Ephesians are used by the Calvinists to sort of teach Calvinist doctrines. And, and one way they sort of teach this passage is they'll say that you're so dead in trespasses and sins that you cannot even, you know, you don't even have the ability to believe on Jesus Christ, right? And, and part of Calvinism, this sermon is not all about Calvinism, but, you know, part of the Calvinistic teaching is because you're so totally depraved, that's the two T in Tulip, that God needs to give you the faith in order to believe on Jesus Christ. And only the people that believe on Jesus Christ are the ones that have been given the faith by God to believe on Jesus Christ. And this is all sort of part and parcel in God choosing who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. So this is what they believe, right? 
But this is not the case, right? This is just saying that no matter what we do, our spirit is dead and we sin. But that doesn't mean we don't have faith in order to put on Jesus Christ to quicken us. Like we saw in Ephesians 1, who first trusted in Christ. That's where we get those blessings. So we do have the faith in order to believe on Jesus Christ. So faith is not only given to some people. Right? The ability to believe is given to everybody. Look at Romans 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, look, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. See, so Calvinists have this idea that, you know, you know God only chooses who gets saved and who doesn't, and the one he chooses he get to get saved he gives those ones faith to believe on Jesus Christ. And then this is how they sort of interpret these verses. So I'll just touch on this as well. So this is another thing, because they'll say, um, the Calvinists will say, well, you know, you can only believe on God if God, you know, draws you first, if God reaches out to you first. And, you know, that is true. John 6, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. But what they fail to see, or well, I guess they, maybe they have a different explanation, is that in John, look at, in John 12, look at what Jesus says in verse 32, and, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is part of the call to everyone to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the draw, that's the call. So yes, we can't go to God. No man seeks after God, right? God seeks after them. But God seeks after everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. And because of that, we're able to respond to that grace. We're able to respond to that call in faith, the faith that he gives to every man. And we put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we will be quickened from the dead, you know, quickened spiritually. So this is the big, this is my last thought on this is Calvinism on this verse, is that's the big contradiction in Calvinism. Like if you ever speak to a Calvinist, this is the one where I feel like they cannot respond to because this is just like the, the contradiction of what Calvinism teaches to what is blatantly described as God's will in the Bible, right? So what do I mean by that? So Calvinism teaches that God, God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell because he's the one that grants faith, he grants the repentance, and only if he grants the faith and repentance do they then respond Right, So you see how the ball is in God's court. God decides. Because it's not up to the person because they don't have a choice. They are only able to make the choice because God gave them the faith to make the choice. So it's God's decision. Now, that goes completely contrary to what we see in God's word. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will, what does that mean? That will means that's his desire, right? His will, who will, he wants who will have all men to be saved. So this is not like the way we speak English is, is just saying that's what's going to happen. This is saying God wants, right? He will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. I'll read a few more verses and then I'll explain clearly to you why this is a like a big contradiction. 2 Peter 3, look, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to us with. So he's saying, like, why is God taking a, his, you know, taking a long time to return? He gives people a lot of chance to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have your whole life sometimes to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he's slack. It's not that he's lazy about it. It's that he's long-suffering. He's giving you an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ. He's patient. Not willing. So he said, this is not what he wants. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? And that's to believe on Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, 17. Look at this. This is like the last chapter in the Bible, the final call, the final beseeching of all unbelievers. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So the Bible is very explicit in saying God wants everyone to be saved. So let me ask you, if, if it's God's choice who gets saved and who doesn't get saved, why is God contradicting his own will? 
Do you see what I'm saying? Like if God's will is, I want everyone to be saved and it's his choice, you would think that to be consistent with your will, you would make the choice to save everyone. Give everyone faith, give everyone repentance, so that everyone is elected and everyone goes to heaven because that's what you're saying you want. What doesn't make sense is all throughout the Bible to beseeching everyone to believe on you and say, come, and I want everyone to be saved, to then make the decision to not save everyone. But if salvation is your decision, then it makes sense because God wants everyone to be saved, but why doesn't everyone get saved? Because you refuse salvation. You refuse the grace of God. Right? So if you understand, I think if you understand that argument, that's something, you know, when I talk to Calvinists that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going against something that, you know, like it, it's like a contradiction that they can't resolve. And it's one of those things where they have to just throw their hands up and just say, well, I just trust God to do the right thing. But I say to them, well, maybe there's another answer. You know, maybe the answer, maybe you don't have to, you know. I don't, I'm not saying all things have to necessarily make sense, you know, because God is beyond us. And sometimes we have to just trust God's word. But if there's a position that's sound that you can move to that still accurately explain, explains all the Bible, maybe you've got a wrong position there. So that's not what being dead in trespasses means. And I just wanted to sort of touch on that point there. So that's a big contradiction in Calvin. Let's go on. Verse 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. So, so you can see here verse 2 and 3, this is what it's talking about, being dead in trespasses and sins, that we, we basically walked in sinful ways, right? Because that's all we could do. You couldn't walk in the spirit. Our spirit was dead. We're walking in the flesh. And when you're not saved, when you're not quickened by the spirit through faith on Jesus Christ, you are a sinner, right? And that's all you can, that's all you can be. Right? So at least you don't even have the choice now to have that struggle between the spirit and the flesh. The prince of the, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, it's a reference to obviously Satan, the spirit that, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So see, this is what you have to understand. You know, the Holy Spirit works through us and there's a supernatural aspect to it. But the way it manifests in this world is through words. You know, the word of God is the spirit of God. This is how you know when the Spirit of God is in church, because the Word of God's being preached. And you have to understand, Satan works the same way, right? Where there's the Spirit of the power of the air, the Spirit, the Prince of the power of the air, the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's not just this sort of nebulous feeling that works through them. It's, these are thoughts, these are ideas, these are, these are philosophies that get preached throughout the world. You know, when you think about all these things that are going on in the world and people start adopting all these, these weird things and false doctrine, that's how these spirit works in the children of disobedience. You know, what is it? That it's okay to fornicate. That it's okay to live like this. You know, you just get an abortion if you fornicate. It's okay to do all these things. It's okay to dress however you want. It's okay to follow your heart. You know, this is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience of people that believe into these lies rather than the word of God. And they become children of wrath, children of disobedience, children of the devil that we see among whom also we had our conversation, so that's our, our lifestyle, not just our speech, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So you see that? This is where we get this verse where, you know, what do we inherit from Adam? We don't inherit his guilt, we inherit this sinful nature, right? And when our spirit dies, that's, that's all we can follow. That's why we're sinners. We need to put our faith on Jesus Christ to be made alive again. Now this verse reminds me a lot of 1 John 3. <clears throat> we see, a little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Right? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So remember, we're talking about in Ephesians 2. The theme of Ephesians 2 is what Jesus is accomplishing through the death, burial, and resurrection. I feel like it's very consistent here with 1 John 3, that, you know, see, this is why the Son of God's manifested. He died, he rose again to destroy the works of the devil, to, to make you alive from these dead trespasses and sins. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So you can see that dichotomy there, 
of the spirit and the flesh being the children of God and the children of the devil. And unfortunately, as saved believers, we live with both. That's why there's that, 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 that struggle that is described in Galatians. And we see here as well in Ephesians 2 that, you know, without being saved, you know, in time past, right, that's the way we walked, right? Because we didn't have an option to walk otherwise, right? And obviously that struggle continues to this day until we, uh, you know, the redemption of our body, like we talked about last week. So that's the first section, right? The first section is being quickened from the dead. That's one thing that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection does for us. It quickens our spirit, you know, being born again, like we see in John 3, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Moses, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's the death, burial, and resurrection, and we believe on that. We look and live, and, and our spirit is made alive. Okay, that's the first one. The second one, that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the crucifixion of Christ does, it's, it's a show of God's grace, right? It, it exemplifies God's grace to us. And, and those of us, you know, who are very familiar with Ephesians 2, we're going to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and you can see there in the context of what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection does, why it's being mentioned here in Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. Right? So it's God's mercy, it's God's love is shown on the cross even when we were dead in sins. Right? So we were dead in trespasses and sins, you know, we we're living according to the course as well, the prince of the power of the air, you know, he's quickened us together by grace ye are saved. Right? So, so you see how he's making the point here and, and it flows on to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, like, which is the verses that we, we know and love dearly, to show that this is all grace. Right? So even from verse 4, he's saying it's, it's God's mercy, it's God's grace, because what were we doing? We were living according to the course of this world. Right? We were dead in trespasses and sins, not us. You know, it's not our, our good works, our righteousness. It's God's grace. And has raised us up together. So like his death, burial, and resurrection, he's, in resurrection, he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So you see, the death, burial, and resurrection throughout the ages, right, is going to show God's grace to us that Jesus Christ died for people dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this same, this same theme is sort of uh, repeated in Romans 5 and probably is, is best said in Romans 5. So we see here, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So this is this, this, is this, um, you know, this love of God that sort of passes understanding, that it's not just God loving those that loved him. He loved the ungodly. What does that mean? People that hated God. People that were enemies of God. Right? And this is why the grace of God is exalted in the death, burial, and resurrection because Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect life. He suffered. He bled. His soul went into hell. And he rose again from the dead. Not for people that loved God. Not for people that appreciated God. It's people that hated God. It's people that were sinners. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. He's saying, what is he saying there? He's saying it's rare that people die for righteous people. Yet peradventure, so he says maybe for a good man, some would even dare to die. You see, that, that verse is just saying that it's very rare for people to even sacrifice themselves for good people, you know, for people that are of integrity and things like that. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you see here that that's why he's saying in verse 8 that God's love was commended, it was praised, it was lifted up in that Jesus Christ died for sinners. Not for righteous men, not for good men, not for those that loved God. He died for those that were enemies. Look at much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved 
from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I want to share with you as well Luke 6 here, because this is this thought here. That this, is, this is God's love. And this is the sort of love that God wants us to attempt to emulate. It's something very difficult. But it's something good to be reminded of. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing. Hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, to the evil, be ye therefore, look at this, merciful as your Father also is merciful. So you see how it all sort of ties together there. The love of God, you know, His grace, His mercy, but it's to people that don't necessarily appreciate it, don't necessarily, des- that don't deserve it, right? And he's saying if you just love people that deserve it, what do you more than others? And that's why that's not the sort of love God wants us to show. So then he goes into Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Right, so he's talking about this, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, showing the grace of God in the ages to come. It's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace. And then that's when he goes into Ephesians 2.89. So if you're wondering the context of Ephesians 2.89, it's in that context where now he then explains what does it mean, grace? Right? Because you're saved by grace. He said it before. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. So it's not you. So it's not you, the one that was dead in trespasses and sins, the enemy of God is going to earn this. Grace means that it's, it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's free. It's G- Jesus paid for it. It's given to you. Right? It's not something you earn. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So now this lest any man should boast also puts it in the context of what do you have to boast about as an enemy of God, as somebody who's dead in trespasses and sin, or your righteousness are as filthy rags. What are you going to boast about when you receive this grace? Right? That's why it's all going to be God. It's giving all God the glory that, um, that we are saved. Right? And obviously we can go into what this means for salvation. You know, the fact that it's free, we don't have to do one work, there's no, you know, turning from sins to be saved, not getting baptized, you know, not coming to church to be saved, turning over a new leaf, none of this. Salvation by grace means you do absolutely no works, right? It's all God and it's none of you. That's the way God gets all the glory, right? Because no man's going to be able to boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So some people think that these verses kind of are saying two different things, which they are not, right? Contradictory things, no. One is saying salvation is by grace. The other is saying, why, why did God want to save us? Right? Why did he create us new in Christ Jesus? Because he wants us to do good works. There's no contradiction there, right? It's like, it's like saying, you know, my children were born, they, they did no work. But do I, want, do I want my children to be obedient children? Yeah. Did I plan for my children to be obedient children before they were even born? Yeah. So it's no different with God. God is saying, like, well, he created you to obey him. That doesn't mean you don't have the free will to not obey him, right? That doesn't mean that you're not his child if you disobey him. It's just all this is saying is here that the reason why God created us in Christ Jesus is because he had good works for us to do and he had planned for them even before the foundation of the world. So again, tying into the, even the theme of Ephesians 1, all these things that God had planned for believers before the foundation of the world, another thing that he has planned before the foundation of the world is good works for believers to do. Now, the best verse to sort of just describe this dynamic is in Romans 5 and Romans 6. So sometimes when people ask me how do these things tie together, it's good to go to these two verses in Romans 5 and Romans 6. Romans 5.20 says, Moreover the law entered, that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So you see that grace is always greater than sin, and no matter how much you sin, grace will always abound more. Right? So even if sin abounds, grace always abounds more. There's that eternal security, there's that salvation, there's that grace that is always greater than sin. But then Romans 6 says, does that mean then it's okay to keep sinning? Is that the right thing to do? Now, if you keep doing the wrong thing, 
you keep on sinning, are you still saved? Romans 5, yes. Right? Because where sin abound, grace did much more abound. But what is Romans 6 alluding to, which is the same as Ephesians, 2 chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is, is that the right thing to do? Is that what God wants you to do? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that the right thing to do? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Right, so there's no contradiction here. What is just saying that's not the right thing to do. But even if you do the wrong thing, even if sin abounds, grace will much more abound. That's salvation. Right? That's the grace of God. That's what grace means. You know, grace means you, you're, not good, you, you're not good enough to get it. That's why it must be given to you. And it, and it never made sense to me that you can't be good enough to get something, but you can be bad enough to lose it. How can you not deserve it anymore when you never deserved it to begin with? You know, so this is what grace means. Grace means you get something you don't deserve. It's an unmerited favour. It's grace. Okay, so we're saved by his grace, not our works. There are good works preordained for us. Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound, no, God forbid. All right? But we are still saved regardless. And number three, that Jesus Christ accomplishes with his death, burial, and resurrection in Ephesians 3 is he's abolished these ordinances. Now, these were the ordinances that dif dis differentiated in the Old Testament, right? The nation of Israel from the Gentile nations. That's why these, these, these abolished ordinances start going into why there's no longer there's this, this distinction, right? Because in the Old Testament, the physical nation was a picture of things to come. Right? It wasn't the true nation. This is what people have to understand. Is yes, God chose a nation to, to, to keep that initial covenant. But they broke it a long time ago. Right? It's like nobody could ever be that nation due to the covenant because the covenant was broken. So the covenant of being part of that nation was always by grace. Right? It was always a promise. Right? But then he still dealt with that physical nation as an example for us in the New Testament. But the real nation was always believers, right? Even those who were physically circumcised were only part of the nation because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So this is what he talks about here for these next couple of verses. Ephesians 2.11. But how does it tie in to the death, burial, and resurrection? It's because through the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus Christ abolished a lot of these ordinances that were required right, in this old covenant, right? Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, look at this, Gentiles in the flesh, I want you to notice this wording here, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So it's interesting here that he's even alluding to this fact that just because people are circumcised, it doesn't make them a real Jew, right? That's why he's saying, you're, you were called uncircumcision, that's what you were called, right, back in the past, and they were called the circumcision. But who are the true circumcision and uncircumcision? Right, we're going to look at that in a moment. That at that time you without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So you weren't part of the nation of God. You know, you're not part of the nation of Israel. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So you see here now, through Christ Jesus, everyone can be part of God's nation. And, you know, the, and we'll look later, the true people that were always part of the nation were the ones in Christ, right? Were the ones who believed on, on the Lord. But now in Christ Jesus, you sometime were far from made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, as he's talking about these two people, two different, Jew and Gentile, both one, broken down the middle wall of petition between us, so these are the sort of things, these are the things he's describing, like I said, Jesus has done because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Broken down that middle wall petition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, right? So that enmity is talking about that you, you know, you're these, this, they're, they're divided, they're separated. <laughs> abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law, how were they divided? Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Right? So he's already talked about one, circumcision. For to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. So he's reconciling them both into one, the Jew and Gentile into one, 
through his body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So in that sort of passage, he's sort of talking about Jew and Gentile now being part of the one nation. That's one thing Jesus Christ accomplished. So in the Old Testament, my understanding is, I, I, I may have this wrong, but my understanding is if you wanted to become a Jew, right? So, so being a Jew is not just an, eth- like a, an ethnicity, meaning like it's not just your, des- des- your descendancy, right? Because in the book of Esther, there are many people that became Jews, for fear of the Jews. Right? So you can become a Jew. Now the way you became a Jew, which is you were part of the nation. So don't think of it like, like, a, like a race. There are, there are no races, first of all, right? But don't think of it like that. You need to think of it as kind of like citizenship. Citizenship, like in Australia, if you want to become an Australian citizen, how do you do it? There are certain things that you have to abide by, right? You abide by, you know, you've got to take, a, take an oath, and then you, you uh, what do you say? You, um, oh, that oath you take on, on Australia Day, right? So that's how you become an Australian citizen. But how do you become a citizen of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? What well, it says here, when a stranger shall, shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So in order to become a a citizen of the nation of Israel, right? What do you have to do? You have to be circumcised and only then can you partake of the Passover and then you'll be treated as one born in the land. So, this is why circumcision is being mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2 because this is one of those ordinances that required you to be part of the nation. But because of Jesus Christ, he's abolished this ordinance. You no longer now have to be circumcised to be part of God's nation. You just have to believe on Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 2 teaches us that those who are the true Jews of the true nation are not those that are physically circumcised. Verse 25, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, look at this, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So you see, so even though you're physically circumcised, he's saying, well, if you don't keep the whole law, then, then, then it doesn't even count as circumcision. It's made uncircumcision. Therefore, the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? Verse 28, look at this. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And, the, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. So Paul makes it very clear in Romans 2 that those who are truly circumcised, truly of the nation of Israel, were those who were circumcised inwardly. Right? Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man but of God. So this is one thing we learn in the New Testament. Right? In the New Testament we learn that the true nation of Israel were those who actually believed on God. Right? So then what was the purpose of the physical circumcision? These are all a shadow. These are all examples of things to come. So it's not just about having this physical cut in your flesh. Look at Philippians 3 two. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware, look at this, of the concision. So why is he referring to those who are circumcised here as the concision? These are the physical Jews, people who just call themselves Jews because they're physically circumcised, but they're not the true Jews, like he says in in Romans 2. Beware of the concision. I like this word that that the Bible uses here. Because concision is like an incision, like a cut. Con is with cut, right? So it's like these are just the people that are just physically cut, right? Beware of the concision. So he doesn't even call them the circumcision here, right? Why? Because he says here in verse 3, For we are the circumcision. Who? Which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You see who the real Jews are, the real nation of God, are those that believe on Jesus Christ and they're the ones that are the true circumcision. 
So Colossians 2 is, Colossians, if you didn't know, is a twin epistle with Ephesians. So if you, sometimes you read Ephesians, you don't understand something, Colossians will go over it again because all the same themes are talked in, uh, in Ephesians, are talked in Colossians as well. But look at, look at what is written here in Colossians 2 to sort of explain this principle here. You are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. So, so why is it that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he rose again, we believe on him, all these ordinances that are required to be part of the nation of Israel are all abolished? Why? Because in him, we fulfill all those ordinances. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Look at this. In whom also ye are circumcised. So you see, when you believe on Jesus Christ, you partake in that true circumcision of the heart, that spiritual circumcision, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, that means we, you know, because we die with Christ, that's how we can be risen again, right? We, we're risen spiritually and also we will be risen physically. With him, through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses. Right? There's that grace. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. So that's that, that enmity. It's contrary because it's not possible to keep, to be in that nation. And took it out of the way. Look at it. Nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumph, triumphing over them in it. So you see there's that grace is greater than the sin, even greater than the, uh, the ordinances, that death, burial, and resurrection exalted the grace of God, triumphing, triumphing over this need to do works for God's favour. Right? Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. So this is now giving some more examples of things that are done away. Meat or in drink, these are the food laws or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. So these special feasts, what was one of the special feasts? The Passover. So you see, and that's how we can now be part of the nation, because before you had to be circumcised, you had to keep the Passover, but in Christ, who is our Passover, we keep those holy days, we're circumcised, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay, so this is, this is, Paul, in Ephesians 2, 11 to 18, these abolished ordinances, and that's what allows us to, to not have to keep these ordinances to become part of this nation, right? The true Israel, which has always been the true Israel, and that's something that we learn in the New Testament. But now, you know, because of Jesus Christ, that's how everyone, you know, well, that's how everyone becomes a part of this nation, faith on Jesus Christ, right? But he's just saying... Jesus Christ has abolished these ordinances and we're all one. And the last point <coughs> is because he's abolished these ordinances, there is now one nation and one house of God. Right? So that's why before, because he's talking to these Gentiles in the Ephesians, everyone was always thinking, you know, it's Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, Right? But he's like, no, there's not that anymore. Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. So that's what it means to be an alien of the commonwealth of Israel. You know, that for the kids, you know, aliens, not, you know, this, this whole concept of aliens is just built on the false notion of evolution. I don't know if you know that. That's why I, I don't believe aliens exist. Now, there's, unfortunately, there's like a lot of Christians that get caught up into all this stuff online and they think aliens exist and all all that sort of stuff, and they think that that's truth-seeking and everything. I don't believe aliens exist. I don't believe there will ever be aliens because I think the reason why the concept of aliens exists is because of this whole idea of evolution, that if we evolved here, maybe somewhere in the universe, more life has evolved. But, you know, as Bible-believing Christians, we know that life didn't evolve on Earth. God created life. And he tells us why he created the stars and the moon and all that. It's created for us. So there's not, there's not this chance that life evolves somewhere else. So when the Bible talks about aliens, it's just talking about foreigners, people who are not citizens. Right? So, so he goes on here in verse 19, strangers, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 
See, that's why this is this true nation of, of Israel, right? the spiritual nation of Israel, that now Gentiles, you know, through faith on Jesus Christ, can be part of that nation. And they could always have joined the nation even before as well. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that's this building up, this analogy of this building up of this house. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. My understanding of this cornerstone is like it's like the first block that's laid. So it's like the first block that's laid, and that's going to sort of set the pattern for the rest. So if you set that off wonky, you know, so Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So it's not only just talking about one nation, it's also talking about one house or one building where God dwells. Right? So we know our temple is the body of the Holy Spirit. So this, this concept is taught throughout the Bible. right? So we have here in Galatians 3.28, this is probably one of them. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So you see there that, that idea that if we believe on Jesus Christ, there's now just one people, right? One nation, one house. And, you know, I wish, you know, I, I wish, um, you know, the world, you know, you hope that the world, like, just understands, like, you know, all this racism that's going on. And, you know, racism just stems from evolution, stems from the belief that we come from different races. But if, you, you know, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, there are no races. You know, how far do you go back? If you go, even if you go back to, to Noah, who came off the ark, we all came from one family, right? Genesis, we all came from Adam and Eve. There are no races, right? There's one race, the human race, and we just have different colour hair. We just have different colours, right? And there's different cultures. But, you know, I believe that you know, at church, these cultures should start coming together. You know, that there isn't all these... I don't think God's will is that, you know, you have, like, you know, like today, you have, like, the Chinese church, and then you have this church. I mean, obviously, with different languages, it's a bit, bit different, right? I'm not talking about languages. But it's like, you know, you have, like, this culture church and that culture. They all speak English, but then they're just targeting certain ethnicities. And I don't think that's God's will, that churches target a specific people group, right? It, like I said, it's different with languages because languages need to understand one another, right? But churches, I don't think, should be specific to just one ethnicity. We should just be Christian, right? That's our nation. That's our ethnicity. Once we believe on Jesus Christ, we're Christians first and foremost. So hopefully you take on that belief as well, like we have, because then you don't create these enmity between cultures. Because sometimes, sometimes these cultural divides are sort of, you know, perpetuated by believers as well. You know, say, oh, you know, we're, we're Greek, they're Italian, you know, they're Asian, they're Chinese, you know, and it's like they, they create these divides, whereas believing on Jesus Christ should be bringing people of different ethnicities together, like it says here. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ brought Jew and Gentile together. He didn't want them to continue treating each other, treating, treat, them treating each other like they were different nations, right? Now let's look at this sort of cornerstone doctrine here, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone of this building. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures... The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. So this is why I think it all ties into this theme of Ephesians 2. Jesus Christ's death, burial and resurrection and what he accomplishes, now he's the head of the corner of this one new house, this new building. right? Because what happened to this chief cornerstone? It was rejected. How it was re rejected? It was crucified. You see? So this rejected Stone to become the head of the corner ties it into the death, burial, and resurrection, right? The death was rejected, the resurrection has became the chief cornerstone of this house, right? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say unto you, the kingdom of God, look at this, shall be taken from you. It's the physical nation of the Jews, right? Why was it taken from them? Because they didn't keep the covenant. They didn't keep the old covenant. Nobody could keep the old covenant, right? It's taken from it, given to a nation, 
bringing forth the fruits thereof, right? Which is the true nation, believers on Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Luke 17. So this kingdom of God, right? It's no longer a physical nation, right? It's taken from the physical nation, the kingdom of God given to the spiritual nation. And it's no longer a physical temple either, right? And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, so you can't see it, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So we, what are we talking about? Just to put it into context, what Jesus Christ accomplished, death, burial, and resurrection, it's no longer a physical nation spiritual nation, no longer a physical place of worship. Like in the Old Testament, there was a temple, now the kingdom of God is within you. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And this is why when we come together, this is why the Bible describes us as the body of Christ, the church of God, this spiritual house, uses the analogy that we are like blocks in this spiritual house. We are this building as it comes together where God is, dwells. And who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of man, that's the rejection, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones, remember that, that being quickened through dead trespasses, we are alive, lively stones are built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him, shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, even to them which stumble at the word. So I love that, the fact that the analogy is that, like, you know, it's the stability, it's the first cornerstone, it gives the direction to build upon, but it's also the rock that it can crush, you know, it can destroy, that people trip over, you know? So it's a, it's a good analogy the Bible uses. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. So this is how this new, like I said, people, new house, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvellous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So tying it all into there, that grace. I wanted to also just share this verse with you from John 4, because Jesus alludes to this as well. This no longer physical worship of God in a physical temple, but this new spiritual temple to the woman at the well. So in John 4, the woman saith unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she has, she's thinking like, hey, there's this physical place of worship to worship God. Where is it? Where's the right place? She's asking uh, Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so just in conclusion, so you can see in Ephesians, just to break it down for you, you know, Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, it quickens us from the dead. Right? And through that it exalts the grace of God, right? Shows his grace. That's where we get those beautiful verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The other thing that Jesus accomplishes is he abolishes the ordinances that created that enmity between us and God, right? We couldn't be part of that nation. But now, because of Jesus Christ, we're complete in him. We, can, we keep the circumcision through him. We keep the Passover. Keep all these ordinances that he nailed to the cross and we can be that one nation, that one house, that, that nation, that true nation of Israel. All right, so thank God for his grace because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does that tell us? We should not continue in sin. 
Right? We don't continue in sin, but we should strive to do good works, like we saw in Ephesians 2.10. And, you know, we need to realise that our real identity is in Christ. Right? We are Christians first. You know, a lot of people, they get carried away with patriotism and their culture. But what I want you to understand is that you as believers, you should be first and foremost Christians. That's our real identity. And it's not in our physical citizenship or our physical descent. Because that's what the Jews were doing, right? Physical nation, their physical descent, and they put so much onus on that that they were even hoping that it would save them. So people nowadays may not do it to that extent. But a good reminder for us, we're Christians first. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning and, and we thank you for you know, the book of Ephesians, just uh, full of great truth and uh, you know, lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. He was listed, lifted up physically, but Lord, he's lifted up, you know, he's exalted. And we just, uh, we just thank you, Lord, that you know, the death, burial, and resurrection will always just uh, praise you for your richness in mercy and grace. And we thank you, Lord, that we have access to that through faith in you. And I uh, just thank you, Lord, for that precious gift. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.